With my 47 years of turning, I went through quite a few of those years with having to sand two areas out of the inside of a bowl quite often, probably more than I ever want to remember. Uh, my early days of sanding, we didn't have power sanding. You used your hand and spun the wood and then you started sanding the end grain to get that part out of there and the tear out it. Uh, but thank goodness for power sanding and actually for the tools we cut with nowadays. There are a number of tools at work. Let me preface this by saying there is no secret to, to cutting cleanly on the inside of the bowl. You can use a number of different types of tools, everything from a scraper right up to a, a number of different types of bowl gouges. They all will work. What you need to understand is how to set yourself up a little bit that you can be successful. I'm going to go through some of those things. I'm going to talk about the tools that I have. Um, you don't need them all, but they're kind of nice toys to play with. Um, you can use a 5 8 inch bow gouge and get a lot done. Uh, we had a question the other night. Brett who brought in that soft maple. He asked, you know, what bow gouge do I buy? And uh, I went through it with them, and basically, you can always turn with a bigger gouge, turn smaller, but you can never turn big with a smaller gouge. So buy the, the one you can afford, and uh, then you can work from there. But you don't need a whole lot of tools to turn a bowl on that one. But we're going to take a look at those, for them, you know, to, to show it on that one. But that one um, is big. What I'm looking at here is a 40-40 grind on a bowl, or excuse me, on a gouge. And the 40-40 is by uh, Stuart Batty, and it's very good for cutting down the side of the bowl. So if I'm doing natural edge bowls, this is my tool to use on the wings. If I'm doing a bowl that's fairly thin, I'm going to use this. The reason I will use it is that I can set it up at 3 o'clock or maybe a little less, 2.30, and I can cut down without much pressure pushing into the side of the bowl. If I were to take a bowl gouge like this and I was trying to cut wings with it, this is probably 70, and push into it, I'm going to make the wings flex on a bowl. They're going to go in and out. And when it goes in and out, the next one comes around, and I just left one that was flexed out, and all of a sudden I just hit one that's not, and it's going to take a pretty good cut out of that one. And that's what happens to you if we, if we talk about wing bowls when you're up on top. But you can do it here too if you push too hard into it. If I were to try to cut the rim on a bowl, I would have the handle way over here and use it down the side of the bowl and go toward the headstock. My pressure is toward the headstock. If I push into the side of a thin bowl, it's going to start to vibrating. And we're going to hear some of those things as we go here. But uh, this one here is, I had a, such a bargain I couldn't pass it up on this one. It's a one inch U, and the U is right here. That's what we refer to as the flute. This one is an Ellsworth, and that's a parabolic. On that one, so uh, and this one also is a parabolic, but you can get a V from Thompson, and we're going to explain a little bit about the difference and how they cut. But you can see the width of this one; it's a pretty wide mouth in this in this gouge. The only reason I have this is if I want to go over the tool rest by quite a distance. That's a hunk of one-inch steel back here, and that's really going to help me. Uh, keep this thing from jumping all over. You'll notice the handle's quite long on it. I don't use it very often, but if I'm in a fairly deep, large bowl, I will work with that. Um, I have some other ones here. And we're going to talk a little bit about Thicknesses. 
And what's the difference in the thicknesses when I start cutting a bowl? And we, you know, of course, this one is a 3 8 uh, bowl gouge. It's not very long, but it's got a fairly long flute in it. My maximum over the tool rest is probably going to be about that far before it starts to vibrate. And you won't hear it vibrating so much as you will. It will be on the wood, and the wood might, your, your tool might bounce a little bit, or you might you feel something coming through it. But that's vibration. It doesn't, doesn't take much. It's ringing in my hands right here. It doesn't take much to make this vibrate. A spindle gouge will vibrate even quicker. A spindle gouge, you really don't want to go much more than an inch on a lot of those spindle gouges on that one. Uh, this one is a half inch bowl gouge. And I can go a little farther with this one. So it's, it's, it's not going to vibrate. We're going to play with those and listen to them. We're going to use your ears if you have better ones than I do. And try to uh, pick up some of the, the sounds of that on that one. This one here is a half inch. Well, you'll notice the grind on it. This is ground straight across. And that's the bottom, what we call a bottom feeder. And we have, I have one in 5 8 I have one here. But what's the difference between a 5 8 and a half inch other than size? Okay. If you're thinking about this, one is vibration. Two is the width of the cut when you start to use it. So this is much, can take a finer cut. So if I just want to take a little bit of wood off, I already have a great shape, but I'm trying to take a little bit of wood off without causing too much cut. If I'm using a bigger one like this, I'm going to cut a wider cut. It's just very difficult to cut without taking a, a let's say, a 3 16th inch cut compared to a 1 8th inch cut, or maybe less. So if I'm tool rest is in the bowl, and I'm close, and I just want to clean up very lightly, you're going to see me using this one more than this one. If I want to make the shape of the bowl and cut to the bottom, then I'm going to be probably using my 5 8 inch bowl. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. And, and is this better than this one? Not always. Sometimes it's better to have swept back wings. And is a V better? A V is a Thompson. And the Thompson gouge is going to have a little sharper point. So you can take off a fairly fine, thin line, but it's much easier to end up with ripples and moving <clears throat> in and out. A parabolic flute, D-way, um, Ellsworth, those gouges have a wider sweet spot in them. You're going to take a wider cut, not necessarily a thicker cut, but a wider cut with those types of bowl gouges. And that's, and that's where the, the draw is, which way do you want to do it? How do you want to take off that wood? Is it okay to take out a wider one, or do I want to take out a thinner one and less width to it. Then I have to go to the thinner one. But this gouge here will turn everything. A 5 8 inch gouge will turn everything. Even though this is about a 60, a 60 uh, nose on here, it could turn as long as I don't go over the tool rust too far. When I get over the tool rust too far, then it's going to vibrate. You're going to hear this thing shake a little bit on that, on those. Um, Here, we're going to talk a little bit about a scraper, and we're going to probably put this on the end of this uh, demo. This is a fluteless gouge, and it's sold by Thompson. There is no flute in this gouge. This should be used cutting with the flat, basically vertical, and you can trim it. But what I've done is ground it the opposite way that I can put this flat on the tool rest and I can use it as a scraper. Then when I scrape with it, the wood is going to catch up here at about 11 o'clock and come down the side of that wood as a shear cutter. So 
this what is do you my mean? interior. What do you mean when you say you ground it the other way? It should be going this way. I have it ground this way. So it should look like a normal, it should look like a normal gouge, but it's not. So I turned it into a, a scraper. This is my flat. If I had it normal way, I could do this, but what I'm after is having that sharp burr cut the wood down the side of this, this tool. Okay? Ray looks very puzzled. So. I have never seen that before. No, he won't either. Some of us you know, have our own little secrets on that one. Okay, any questions on tools themselves? Anything you, you didn't understand or you want to more pronounced, pronounced, whatever, on that one? Okay? Um, but again, all of them will work. It's just a matter of, we're going to start here with a 40-40 grind on this tool. This is the Ellsworth, or excuse me, the Batty grind. And as we grind, we'll talk a little bit about tool rest and position. Everybody remember when Stuart, if you came to the Stuart Batty demo, when he finished the cut, he wanted to be exactly at center line. Okay? And that's very important. Because when you're cutting around the bottom or the bottom part of the bowl here, you want to be able to finish. You don't want to be above it. You don't want to be below it. Because that will affect the cut. You can tilt it in and cut this way, or you can start out out here if you don't need it. But what I'm looking for is where I'm comfortable that I finish in that position. Now, again, I said this one is great to get down about here. Now you're going to see it come out of the cut. And by my glasses. Got enough light on there? Pull the light down a little more if you can. I'll try. Better. More better. More better, yep. Okay, we talked about being on the top here. And this is at 3 o'clock. If I rotate the tool with my right hand, this hand doesn't do much. All it's doing is going to just rest on top of it. But if I rotate it, I'm going to take wood off more quickly, and it's going to be a little bit rougher cut, but not too bad. But it'll go down the tool rest here. I'll speed it up a little bit. Now, when I start to get about here, see what's happening? You see the tool jumping? You hear it? It doesn't want to cut. It's bumping on the back part of this bevel right now. Oh man, what do I do now? I'm going to drop the handle, raise it above center, and arc it down towards the center. I have to do that. If I try to go in here with it straight, it's going to get thicker. It's going to get thicker. Until it starts bouncing all over. Very growling. And I just went, <laughs> I went over about 7 sixteenths of an inch deeper in the bowl than I wanted to. And I've got, if I look at this, I have another line right in here. And those were being caused by trying to control by going up and down into the bowl. So it can be done, and this is the way a lot of turners would turn back in the 80s, 70s, 80s. They would turn it. They would drop this down. But sometimes you start to get a smaller lathe, you're going to have trouble with this thing to hit the waves on you. So that can be a bit of a problem. The great job up here, you can see this is cut cleanly, beautiful. All the grain perfect up here. But when I started to turn the corner, I had trouble with that. Along with having the tool rest in the right place is having sharp tools. I cannot emphasize too much that if your tool is dull, you're going to have trouble keeping it in the cut. You're going to have trouble coming around the bottom of the bowl and cutting it cleanly. I have bounced this one off the lathe a few times, so the nose is not in real good shape on this tool. And uh, yeah. Okay. 
you hear it? Look at what's coming off the tool right here. It's, it's no pearls. I don't see anything like this. It's just so dull now that I can't really cut the cut the wood. Those last ones on that cast iron really held it out on that one. So I need something with a little bit more exactly the same tool, except this one is sharp. So Now, it's going to go deeper. Yeah. That's being caused by going over the tool rest. I had no problem out there. So I have to put a little more pressure on the flute. And now you can hear the heel. The heel down here, this one is not ground off the heel. And you can hear See that bumping going on in there? That's being caused by that. How do I correct it? I'm going to have to use the nose a little bit more and slide the tool down the tool rack. Now I just took that vibration out. But what I had to do is, again, this is a, a parabolic. This is a D-Wave. And I was able to use the wider nose to cut around the corner there. And I don't have a whole lot of pressure on the tool. Okay, so now if we step up another one. This is a 5 8 inch. And this one's about a 70. See how it came around the corner? Much better than my little half inch here. So the size of the tool makes a difference on the cut. And you can look at this and it's clean. I didn't try to take too much wood out. If I try to take too much in one cut, What did I do? I went as fast as I could. You have two choices. Slow down or speed up the lathe. And if you look in this one, you can see the number of grooves in there. If I could see the pencil right here. There's a groove right here. There's another groove right here. There's a number of them across there where I pushed in hard into the wood. And I, it's it's... It's torn right through here, coming right up here, right in here. There you can really see it. Took a lot of wood out of there. So, okay, three things. Speed is important. Tool rest is important. And the, the uh, thickness of the cut. How thick a cut are you trying to take off of this? You can use a lighter tool, but you have to take a finer cut. So, if I take my... 5 8 inch, and this one is uh, straight round across. I can finish out the bottom of a bowl. I can start up here, but I have to take a light cut if the bowl is thin. If, this, if it's, if it's uh, a thin bowl, and I'm starting to push with this bevel. The other thing you're going to notice on this one is I have not ground this back. So whether we can go around the corner it's pretty steep line. Got to get a little of the shavings off of it. Now, I'm at 3 o'clock with the flute. I'm going to turn the flute up. Now I'm on the dangerous side. I'm cutting on the left side of the nose. And if you look at this, I'm going to turn it off before I hurt myself. You can see the build up here, and right below it is where this tool was cutting. So there's powder here, and then right below it, that's where the, you can see where the tool has been rubbing, right on the nose there. 
So if I keep the flute up and I come around the corner here, notice I have to move the handle way over to the right. It's cutting on the left hand side, but it's getting difficult to control it. Okay, why? All my cutting is on the left hand side here. Everything's cutting on the left. So there's nothing to counteract it. There's nothing to keep me from, I have to my, use my hand to keep it from rolling back. And I can't go too thick because I can't get the waste wood out of there when it's cutting over on the left side. All right, so I'm going to turn this over to 2.30, 3 o'clock. Try to get it back in the groove here. Get that out of the way. Now I got the it's balanced, and if I turn it down to about 3:30, now I have it coming off the other side here. It's not going to go again. I got a feeling that's getting a little dull on me. So I'm going to lighten up to my half inch here. But I'm going to put the tool rest in because I don't want to have too much wood out there on that. Notice how light this is. You see how that cut much better? So that tool wasn't quite as sharp as I thought it was. And look at the whip. Look at the width of those curls coming off here. Now let's take a look at that, backing it up. Hear it? It's vibrating all over the place. Because this tool cannot operate that far over a tool rest and it's got a big bump right up below this line here right in between those two I'd have to sand for a while to get that out of there on that so again the lighter the tool the lighter the cut and if you're just taking a little bit off if we uh, if we can put a Something like that. You just you say you have it there, and you have it like that. Now we have we have a high spot there and there, and I want to get that out of there. Do I need my five eighths? I could use my five eighths, but if I can, I can use either one of these. It'll work fine with that one, or it'll work fine with this one. They both will take that out of there. But if I go after it with this one, see that little shaking going on there? Good. And it cleaned it up there. But I can also take this one. This bottom feeder with the wings up like this can put the smoothest bottom in a bowl. And one of the things you can do with them is matching the bevel actually will form a curve. So if I'm, I won't push in with this tool very much. And look at the bottom of the bowl now. You see the arc? I'll get back underneath it there. It's a little lower right there, so I knew I need to get some more wood out of there. And I'm going over the limit of this tool a little bit. It's starting to vibrate a little bit.
might be getting a little dull out there. It's kicking out so that's lower on that one. But sometimes this tool can take the bottom off fairly well. I'm just trying to get rid of it. One of the things with this one is as you come around the corner with a wet back gouge. And remember the last time I slid the tool down the tool rest? This time I'm going to pivot it so my pivot point's going to be about here. As it comes around, hear that? That's that all that bevel, all that bevel rubbing right up in there. So it's bumping pretty hard on that one. How do I correct it? I use this finger here a little bit and push into it a little bit. Now notice how slow I'm going to the bottom of that bowl. I don't want to speed that up. And beginning turners have a large tendency, they're, they're a little nervous about it, and they want to get that thing cut quicker. You want to do it quickly. But you don't need to if you have a sharp tool. Let the tool do the work. Now we're going to speed this up a little bit more. I think we're running about 1800 now. What do you notice about the curls? This tool is starting to get dull here. They're smaller yet. Why? They're narrower because I'm going slowly. Okay, this, this tool is capable of taking wider cut. Width wise, it's also capable of taking a thicker cut, a wider cut. But the speed, if I go into the piece and scrape, these things are about a sixteenth of an inch wide on that cut. So if I'm roughing out, you know, it's not a problem. Let's take a look at let it look a little bit of a, a blow. We talked about it some, but. If the tool rest is below center, not only are you going to have trouble getting to the center, but the wood is going to be coming around and you have your handle fairly straight, you're taking the wood as it's starting to move away from the tool. It's moving away from the tool. So to compensate for that, if you lift it, you're going to come off the bevel. If you drop it, you're going to take it out of the cut. And that's the two problems right away. Is on here, I've got the handle down. If I have the handle up, this is a really a little more of a scrape. It's really, I'm right on the edge of the devil right now. But I'm having to move it with my hand. And you can see what a sharp tool does. Now, if I drop the handle too far, if now I'm trying to come around the corner, I can't cut anything. It won't work anymore. Even if I even if I try to go up, it's gonna come out. It's gonna start coming up on the heel. So does everybody understand that? Makes sense there. And just the opposite, if I go above the tool rest, or excuse me, above the center. Now I'm up here, and the wood's going that way away from me. I can cut it. But actually, actually, it's going to go higher. It's a little, a little too good there. To cut it, I have to drop the handle a little bit. And come along, and then how the heck am I going to get to the center? 
Bring the handle way up and try to cut down in there. Well, you can see where that is also. It gets you in trouble. So, what are you going to take away tonight? One, sharp, sharp tool. Sharpen them whatever way you can. Uh, you know, if you jig them, that's fine. If you freehand them, uh, you can put them the way you want. But it takes time to learn that, of course. But you're doing the same thing here as you're doing there. You're learning <laughs> to read a bevel when you're grinding and feeling it. Uh, you might grind away the heels. Cut down the size of the, the uh, bevel. This one here, you can see, has been ground off quite a bit on there. So you can play with that a little bit. The bottom feeder... Uh, again, it's got to be sharp. Once it's sharp, most people can make it come around the corner because all I'm really doing is bringing this around level. If I'm if I'm at the center line, I'm above. So if I'm at the center line, this tool is just going to come around as long as I don't hurry too much and pull it out of the cut, or if I don't push into it and make it go deeper into the wood. All I'm really after is getting that thing to start cutting and take my time and let it form that arc in the bottom. And it's always best to leave it, not that big a bump, but a little bump in the bottom rather than a divot. You can sand that little bump off much better than you can trying to take a divot out of there in the bottom of the bowl on that one. On that. So, sharp tools, tool rest in the proper area, speed or slow down. And it can say how you feel comfortable, you may have to slow down. Once you got into that, uh, more confidence in your turning, you might speed it up a little bit. Especially realize that this is exponential. The speed here is maybe 20% of what it is out here. So it really gathers speed, foot speed we're talking about. The foot speed, how fast this wood is passing your tool is much faster here than it will be down here. And what is it right in the center? Zero. There is no speed at all right here. And that's why it's so hard, hard to take that little nub out of there. Because it's stuck there on that. Um, we have that, that scraper. Finger tool, we'll put it over here. Just to uh, finish up on this one a little bit and see how this thing functions. Oh, and when you turn, when you finish, if you're turning this pole, say, down to three eighths of an inch, please don't try to come back after you take out the rest of it and try to return the outside. The top part, you know, it'll be wobbling. It'll be, and if it's not, if you put too much pressure into it, it's going to blow the side out of it anyway. So you're going to cut down in increments. You're going to, you know, take your first one. You're going to cut down maybe an inch, and then get this down to where you want it at at three eighths or whatever. And then you're going to, from there, you're going to take down the next inch and get that down there and blend, you know, blend that. In as you go and that's why we're talking about when does this tool come in handy these little uh, half inch ones they are great for picking up where you left off if you come in with a 5 8 inch in a D way it's, uh, it's it's going to take out a wider swap so and I've been turning a lot tonight just by holding on to the end of it here and letting it cut through those bumps and things. And that's what you want to do. You don't want to white knuckle it, overhand grip it, and try to cut through it because you're going to push into the wall. When you push into the wall, you're going to move things around a little bit on those. So it's important that you just uh, let it cut. Let it slice the wood itself. Okay, I'm going to try to slow this down first. Again, I want to get the tool at center line. And that one's a little bit above. It wouldn't hurt me to be a little bit above. 
I really don't want to be a little bit below. I do want some speed. Look a little too fast. <coughs> Again, very light pressure. You're going to go at about 11 o'clock on this tool. Pretty light. 